Personal Memoirs of You, S. Grant, complete by Ulysses S. Ulysses Simpson, Grant. Chapter 2. West Point Graduation. In the winter of 1838-9 I was attending school at Ripley, only ten miles distant from Georgetown, but spent the Christmas holidays at home. During this vacation my father received a letter from the Honorable Thomas Morris, then United States Senator from Ohio. When he read it he said to me, Ulysses, I believe you are going to receive the appointment. What appointment? I inquired. To West Point, I have applied for it. But I won't go, I said. He said he thought I would, and I thought so too if he did. I really had no objection to going to West Point, except that I had a very exalted idea of the acquirements necessary to get through. I did not believe I possessed them, and could not bear the idea of failing. There had been four boys from our village, or its immediate neighborhood, who had been graduated from West Point, and never a failure of any one appointed from Georgetown, except in the case of the one whose place I was to take. He was the son of Dr. Bailey, our nearest and most intimate neighbor. Young Bailey had been appointed in 1837. Finding before the January examination following that he could not pass, he resigned and went to a private school and remained there until the following year, when he was reappointed. Before the next examination he was dismissed. Doctor. Bailey was a proud and sensitive man and felt the failure of his son so keenly that he forbade his return home. There were no telegraphs in those days to disseminate news rapidly, no railroads west of the Alleghenies, and but few east, and above all, there were no reporters prying into other people's private affairs. Consequently it did not become generally known that there was a vacancy at West Point from our district until I was appointed. I presume, Mrs., Bailey confided to my mother the fact that Bartlett had been dismissed, and that the doctor had forbidden his son's return home. The Honorable Thomas L. Hamer, one of the ablest men Ohio ever produced, was our member of Congress at the time, and had the right of nomination. He and my father had been members of the same debating society, where they were generally pitted on opposite sides, and intimate personal friends from their early manhood up to a few years before. In politics they differed. Hamer was a lifelong Democrat, while my father was awake. They had a warm discussion, which finally became angry over some act of President Jackson, the removal of the deposit of public monies, I think after which they never spoke until after my appointment. I know both of them felt badly over this estrangement, and would have been glad at any time to come to a reconciliation, but neither would make the advance. Under these circumstances my father would not write to Hamer for the appointment, but he wrote to Thomas Morris, United States Senator from Ohio, informing him that there was a vacancy at West Point from our district, and that he would be glad if I could be appointed to fill it. This letter, I presume, was turned over to Mr. Hamer, and, as there was no other applicant, he cheerfully appointed me. This healed the breach between the two, never after reopened. Besides the argument used by my father in favor of my going to West Point that he thought I would go, there was another very strong inducement. I had always a great desire to travel. I was already the best traveled boy in Georgetown, except the sons of one man, John Walker, who had emigrated to Texas with his family, and immigrated back as soon as he could get the means to do so. In his short stay in Texas he acquired a very different opinion of the country from what one would form going there now. I had been east to Wheeling, Virginia, and north to the Western Reserve, in Ohio, west to Louisville, and south to Bourbon County, Kentucky, besides having driven or ridden pretty much over the whole country within fifty miles of home. Going to West Point would give me the opportunity of visiting the two great cities of the continent— Philadelphia and New York. This was enough. When these places were visited I would have been glad to have had a steamboat or railroad collision, or any other accident happen, by which I might have received a temporary injury sufficient to make me ineligible, for a time, to enter the academy. Nothing of the kind occurred, 
and I had to face the music. Georgetown has a remarkable record for a western village. It is, and has been from its earliest existence, a democratic town. There was probably no time during the rebellion when, if the opportunity could have been afforded, it would not have voted for Jefferson Davis for President of the United States, over Mr. Lincoln, or any other representative of his party, unless it was immediately after some of John Morgan's men, in his celebrated raid through Ohio, spent a few hours in the village. The rebels helped themselves to whatever they could find, horses, boots and shoes, especially horses, and many ordered meals to be prepared for them by the families. This was no doubt a far pleasanter duty for some families than it would have been to render a like service for Union soldiers. The line between the rebel and Union element in Georgetown was so marked that it led to divisions even in the churches. There were churches in that part of Ohio where treason was preached regularly, and where, to secure membership, hostility to the government, to the war and to the liberation of the slaves— was far more essential than a belief in the authenticity or credibility of the Bible. There were men in Georgetown who filled all the requirements for membership in these churches. Yet this far-off western village, with a population, including old and young, male and female, of about one thousand about enough for the organization of a single regiment if all had been men capable of bearing arms furnished the Union Army four general officers and one colonel, West Point graduates and nine generals and field officers of volunteers, that I can think of. Of the graduates from West Point, all had citizenship elsewhere at the breaking out of the rebellion, except possibly General A. V. Couts, who had remained in the army from his graduation. Two of the colonels also entered the service from other localities. The other seven, General McGroyerty, Colonels White, Fife, Loudon and Marshall, Majors King and Bailey, were all residents of Georgetown when the war broke out, and all of them, who were alive at the close, returned there. Major Bailey was the cadet who had preceded me at West Point. He was killed in West Virginia, in his first engagement. As far as I know, every boy who has entered West Point from that village since my time has been graduated. I took passage on a steamer at Ripley, Ohio, for Pittsburgh, about the middle of May, 1839. Western boats at that day did not make regular trips at stated times, but would stop anywhere, and for any length of time, for passengers or freight. I have myself been detained two or three days at a place after steam was up, the gang planks, all but one, drawn in, and after the time advertised for starting had expired. On this occasion we had no vexatious delays, and in about three days Pittsburgh was reached. From Pittsburgh I chose passage by the canal to Harrisburg, rather than by the more expeditious stage. This gave a better opportunity of enjoying the fine scenery of western Pennsylvania, and I had rather a dread of reaching my destination at all. At that time the canal was much patronized by travelers, and with the comfortable packets of the period, no mode of conveyance could be more pleasant when time was not an object. From Harrisburg to Philadelphia there was a railroad, the first I had ever seen, except the one on which I had just crossed the summit of the Allegheny Mountains, and over which canal boats were transported. In traveling by the road from Harrisburg, I thought the perfection of rapid transit had been reached. We traveled at least eighteen miles an hour, when at full speed, and made the whole distance averaging probably as much as twelve miles an hour. This seemed like annihilating space. I stopped five days in Philadelphia, saw about every street in the city, attended the theater, visited Girard College, which was then in course of construction, and got reprimanded from home afterwards, for dallying by the way so long. My sojourn in New York was shorter, but long enough to enable me to see the city very well. I reported at West Point on the 30th or 31st of May and about two weeks later passed my examination for admission, without difficulty, very much to my surprise. A military life had no charms for me, and I had not the faintest idea of staying in the army even if I should be graduated, which I did not expect. 
The encampment which preceded the commencement of academic studies was very wearisome and uninteresting. When the 28th of August came the date for breaking up camp and going into barracks I felt as though I had been at West Point always, and that if I stayed to graduation, I would have to remain always. I did not take hold of my studies with avidity. In fact, I rarely ever read over a lesson the second. The time during my entire cadetship. I could not sit in my room doing nothing. There is a fine library connected with the academy from which cadets can get books to read in their quarters. I devoted more time to these than to books relating to the course of studies. Much of the time, I am sorry to say, was devoted to novels, but not those of a trashy sort. I read all of Bulwer's then published, Cooper's, Marriott's, Scott's, Washington Irving's works, Lever's, and many others that I do not now remember. Mathematics was very easy to me, so that when January came, I passed the examination, taking a good standing in that branch. In French, the only other study at that time in the first year's course, my standing was very low. In fact, if the class had been turned the other end foremost I should have been near head. I never succeeded in getting squarely at either end of my class, in any one study, during the four years. I came near it in French, artillery, infantry and cavalry tactics, and conduct. Early in the session of the Congress which met in December, 1839, a bill was discussed abolishing the military academy. I saw in this an honorable way to obtain a discharge, and read the debates with much interest, but with impatience at the delay in taking action, for I was selfish enough to favor the bill. It never passed, and a year later, although the time hung drearily with me, I would have been sorry to have seen it succeed. My idea then was to get through the course, secure a detail for a few years as assistant professor of mathematics at the academy and afterwards obtain a permanent position as professor in some respectable college, but circumstances always did shape my course different from my plans. At the end of two years the class received the usual furlough, extending from the close of the June examination to the 28th of August. This I enjoyed beyond any other period of my life. My father had sold out his business in Georgetown where my youth had been spent, and to which my day dreams carried me back as my future home, if I should ever be able to retire on a competency. He had moved to Bethel, only twelve miles away, in the adjoining county of Claremont, and had bought a young horse that had never been in harness, for my special use under the saddle during my furlough. Most of my time was spent among my old schoolmates these ten weeks were shorter than one week at West Point. Persons acquainted with the academy know that the Corps of Cadets is divided into four companies for the purpose of military exercises. These companies are officered from the cadets, the superintendent and commandant selecting the officers for their military bearing and qualifications. The adjutant, quartermaster, four captains and twelve lieutenants are taken from the first, or senior class, the sergeants from the second, or junior class, and the corporals from the third, or sophomore class. I had not been, called out, as a corporal, but when I returned from furlough I found myself the last but one about my standing in all the tactics of eighteen sergeants. The promotion was too much for me. That year my standing in the class as shown by the number of demerits of the year was about the same as it was among the sergeants, and I was dropped, and served the fourth year as a private. During my first year's encampment General Scott visited West Point and reviewed the cadets. With his commanding figure, his quite colossal size and show uniform, I thought him the finest specimen of manhood my eyes had ever beheld, and the most to be envied. I could never resemble him in appearance, but I believe I did have a presentiment for a moment that some day I should occupy his place on review although I had no intention then of remaining in the army. My experience in the horse trade ten years before, and the ridicule it caused me, were too fresh in my mind for me to communicate this presentiment to even my most intimate chum. The next summer Martin Van Buren, then President of the United States, visited West Point and reviewed the cadets. He did not impress me with the awe which Scott had inspired. In fact I regarded General Scott and Captain C. F. 
Smith, the commandant of cadets, as the two men most to be envied in the nation. I retained a high regard for both up to the day of their death. The last two years wore away more rapidly than the first two, but they still seemed about five times as long as Ohio years to me. At last all the examinations were passed, and the members of the class were called upon to record their choice of arms of service and regiments. I was anxious to enter the cavalry, or dragoons as they were then called, but there was only one. Regiment of dragoons in the army at that time, and attached to that, besides the full complement of officers, there were at least four brevet second lieutenants. I recorded therefore my first choice, dragoons, second, fourth infantry, and got the latter. Again there was a furlough or, more properly speaking, leave of absence for the class were now commissioned officers this time to the end of September. Again I went to Ohio to spend my vacation among my old schoolmates, and again I found a fine saddle horse purchased for my special use, besides a horse and buggy that I could drive but I was not in a physical condition to enjoy myself quite as well as on the former occasion. For six months before graduation I had had a desperate cough. Tyler's grip, it was called, and I was very much reduced, weighing but 117 pounds, just my weight at entrance, though I had grown six inches in stature in the meantime. There was consumption in my father's family, two of his brothers having died of that disease, which made my symptoms more alarming. The brother and sister next younger than myself died, during the rebellion, of the same disease, and I seemed the most promising subject for it of the three in 1843. Having made alternate choice of two different arms of service with different uniforms, I could not get a uniform suit until notified of my assignment. I left my measurement with a tailor, with directions not to make the uniform until I notified him whether it was to be for infantry or dragoons. Notice did not reach me for several weeks, and then it took at least a week to get the letter of instructions to the tailor, and two more to make the clothes and have them sent to me. This was a time of great suspense. I was impatient to get on my uniform and see how it looked, and probably wanted my old schoolmates, particularly the girls, to see me in it. The conceit was knocked out of me by two little circumstances that happened soon after the arrival of the clothes, which gave me a distaste for military uniform that I never recovered from. Soon after the arrival of the suit I donned it, and put off for Cincinnati on horseback. While I was riding along a street of that city, imagining that every one was looking at me, with a feeling akin to mine when I first saw General Scott, a little urchin, bareheaded, footed, with dirty and ragged pants held up by bare a single gallows that's what suspenders were called then and a shirt that had not seen a wash tub for weeks, turned to me and cried, Soldier! Will you work? No, sir e. I'll sell my shirt first. The horse trade and its dire consequences were recalled to mine. The other circumstance occurred at home. Opposite our house in Bethel stood the old stage tavern where, man and beast, found accommodation, the stable man was rather dissipated, but possessed of some humor. On my return I found him parading the streets, and attending in the stable, barefooted, but in a pair of sky-blue nankeen pantaloons just the color of my uniform trousers with a strip of white cotton sheeting sewed down the outside seams in imitation of mine. The joke was a huge one in the mind of many of the people, and was much enjoyed by them, but I did not appreciate it so highly. During the remainder of my leave of absence, my time was spent in visiting friends in Georgetown and Cincinnati, and occasionally other towns in that part of the state. 